Okay, so we're just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, in-memory computing technology and some of the uh, solutions that are out there. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, have everybody here on our panel just introduce themselves, who they are, who they work for, a little bit about uh, their business, and uh, um, a little bit about their role. Hi, everyone. So my name is Chris Jenkins. I'm Senior Director of Product Management at uh, Oracle Corporation, and I look after the Oracle Times 10 in-memory database product line, which you may or may not have ever heard of. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Bain. I'm founder and CEO of Scaleout Software. We develop in-memory data grids. We've been in business since 2005. I want to thank Terry and Nikita and Gridgain for hosting this conference and uh, for stimulating all the technology development in the in-memory computing community. So we owe them a, a debt for that. Uh, my name is Nikita Ivanov. I'm a founder and CTO of Gridgain Systems. I'm responsible, badly so, for Gain Ignite. Okay. So, uh, first question um, What were the most important in memory computing technology developments over the past three years, looking backwards a bit? I, from my point of view, it's what we just heard five minutes ago the persistence memory, persistent memory. Um, I think it's, it is important. I mean, it's exciting, you know. For me, the problem is that we've heard, I mean, I've been hearing the same pitch for the last five, six years. So we'd like to see, I would like to see the, the actual development in this area. Uh, but it's undoubtedly the most exciting thing, actually, that happened for a memory computing. And it probably, I mean, it happened, it is happening, and it will be happening probably for the next another five years before we see any kind of traction. But uh, nonetheless, I still believe that's probably uh, the biggest thing. Well, I can't argue with that, but um, I would like to echo Nikita's comment from yesterday. I think the integration of data parallel computing into in-memory data grids is stimulating um, lots of new opportunities for applications that weren't present before. Uh, for example, uh, Integrating uh, IoT into in-memory data grids is enab enables us uh, with data parallel computing to find aggregate trends across many data sources. That's one example. It also stimulates HTAP and HOAP because now you can operationally uh, store data and act on it at the same time analyzing it without moving data. So uh, the integration of data parallel computing I think is a, a really major trend So uh, amongst others, but let's go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to be boring and actually completely agree with Nikita. Uh, certainly at Oracle, probably the biggest thing we've seen in the last few years and, and going forward is, is non-volatile memory, persistent memory. We've been doing a ton of work with this uh, and I continue to do so. And I think it's a complete game changer actually. It's going to revolutionize the in-memory computing space. The other big thing that I found uh, very interesting over the last few years, it's not directly in-memory related, but it does dovetail in. Um, is the great increase in networking speeds and the availability of things like RDMA over converged Ethernet. When you're building a distributed in-memory system, these things are becoming really critical now. And I, I speak as we launched a distributed version of our product last year that's so dependent on the network, so these faster networks and the availability of these across a wider range of hardware and particularly in many cloud vendors now is a real important thing for us as well. I just actually want to uh, echo what Bill said. Just want to make a note. Um, remember like 10 minutes ago, we, we've heard uh, that one of the cool things that happening in a um, persistent memory uh, ecosystem is moving computations to the data. I just want to note that in the, in the memory data grids, we've been doing it for about 15, 20 years already. So uh, this is the cornerstone of everything we do. Uh, we're moving computations to the data and has been doing this for literally almost two decades by now. So if any of you guys already been using the memory, you know, data grids or any data grids based technologies, oh, you've been doing this already. So uh, that's kind of, you know, a very cool aspect of, you know, how a memory computing as a software, in, you know, category uh, is really on a, on, a, on a cutting edge of what we do. 
two comments. One, uh, data parallel computing actually goes back 30 years. I want to show my age uh, with uh, multi-computers developed by Caltech and Intel. And uh, really, the only difference between an in-memory data grid uh, doing MapReduce and a Multi-computer is simply the hardware and the in, and the interconnect. I also want to echo Chris's comment about uh, the interconnect uh, because uh, the um, non-volatile memory works sort of in in opposition to the network. The network is, for our in our experience, is always the bottleneck. And so, if you want to have a continuously available system, you must do replication. If you do replication, then the more data you store on a given server, the more you have to replicate. That's not to say that we won't see widespread adoption. It's just um, opposing forces to some extent. And what I'd like to see is an integration of persistent memory with RDMA, uh, remote direct memory access, so that you could have the network speeds increase and the latencies are decrease at the same time that memory is uh, growing and, and running fast. I don't have anything more to add on this topic. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, just drilling down a little bit on the PMEM and the non-volatile RAM. How, how do you see that, uh, now that we expect it to become generally available this year, how do you see that impacting in memory computing over the next 12 months, over the next three years? What, uh, you know, what, yeah. what, what's coming? So that's a great question. I said Oracle have been working with this now for a couple of years, very closely with Intel. Um, we're doing a lot of work across several product lines. Uh, the big Oracle database already has some support for non-volatile RAM, uh, persistent memory. Times 10, uh, we've got a prototype already running, and we actually showcased this uh, at the, in the Intel keynote last year at Oracle Open World, where we demonstrated the ability to start from cold uh, a three terabyte in-memory database in five seconds. Basically, it didn't really start up, it was there already. So in yeah. the non-failure scenario, your database is just always there, even if you turn your server off, and that makes a huge difference. And the other thing is, uh, what was mentioned in the previous talk, durable commit performance to memory. We were able to demonstrate live on stage a 7.5x improvement compared to NVMe flash from a prototype. So these kinds of things are really fabulous. The big problem is, you do have to do a lot of internal re-architecture and re-engineering of your product to truly exploit this. You know, using it as a fast SSD is fairly easy, but to get these real big benefits, you do have to do internal changes and other stuff like that. But it, but it really is worth it, and we, we hope to productize some of this stuff uh, next year. So I'm, I'm gonna expose my Russian trace, it'll be there. Uh, glass half empty uh, type of guy. We've been, you know, we've been working and looking, looking and working uh, with a um, non-volatile RAM for literally half a decade by now, and um, that's exactly what I've said, you know, a few minutes ago. I would like to see the actual progress. It's a complex issue. Look, the whole presentation before us was excellent you know, exercise and listing this laundry list of what needs to be done from drivers to the bias to the operating systems to actual hardware to be actually shipping, not a flash with the battery, but to actually know what's called the NVRM P. Uh, it's been long coming. It's still coming. Um, I think, you know, despite, you know, all of us here and, you know, multitude of vendors that's not on the, uh, on the panel right now, Having some kind of preliminary betas and demos and whatnot, I think we're a number of years away from any kind of a serious production usage. You know, kind of wake me up when I can actually go to Amazon and click a button and, and get it there. That's where I get interested. You know, that's why our customers will get interested. You know, just because you can buy some off the shelf one off cards and plug them in, in the servers, that means pretty much nothing in today's world. It has to be widely available on a variety of the, you know, um, the cloud providers. It has to be priced economically and properly. And then, you know, obviously we're not going to wait for that. We're going to be doing it in parallel, but I think that's what needs to be happening. I think it's still, you know, a few, two or three years away. I would agree with that, and we always try not to get too far ahead of our customers. If they don't have the hardware, we can't deploy our products on their systems with this feature. So this, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, 
So many companies are beginning to uh, deploy or at least explore machine learning and deep learning. And, um, you know, in-memory computing often comes up as a, as a uh, enabling technology. What, what role do you see uh, in-memory computing uh, playing in supporting adoption of these technologies over the next year, over the next three years? Okay, from my personal experience, from just from what I've seen at Oracle, so obviously we have our own particular slant on this stuff. Uh, I think it's, it's two things. I mean, machine learning, typically you need very large data sets and you need to really crunch them very heavily to learn, to train the model. So clearly there's a big play for in-memory computing there in just the speed and reducing the time it takes for the training and making that more flexible. But I also think, uh, and it's something we're looking at, you know, the embedding of machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms into sort of databases and in-memory data grids. So it's right there, it's not something separate, it's all part of the platform putting it right next to that data and just crunching it there and doing that stuff in there. So I think those are the two things that we are certainly looking at as, as things to work on over the next few years. Okay. So um, I want to go back to IoT because I think IoT is stimulating the demand for machine learning in in-memory computing systems. I just want to quote one statistic that I, I heard at a Gartner conference. By 2024, at least 50% of enterprise applications will be IoT enabled. And these applications will need machine learning uh, for predictive analytics and other uses. I mean, when you think about in-memory computing, it's all about managing live data, fast-changing data, and data that's streaming in from IoT and other sources is a natural uh, source of data to, on which inferencing can be performed. And I think the IMC platforms are natural for hosting the inferencing side of the process, the training uh, I think will still occur for a while on other systems, but what we really need are continuously training systems so that live systems can improve continuously and do better and better inferencing. But I think IoT will stimulate the need for machine learning and IMC will be the natural host for it. I would agree with both. Uh, just to, you know, a little bit of comment kind of from a Greek game perspective. You know, we, we, I truly believe that that's where I probably a little bit disagree with Bill here. I do believe the training is actually a critical part. And I think we've passed the stage where we could have trained our models once a year or once a decade and then just basically do the inference. We're in a stage where we do a continuous retraining. You know, if you look at the, um, the advanced customers in Silicon Valley, you know, you know, five, seven, ten years ago, you've trained a model once and that's it. You got the model. That was essentially the, your, your product and your inference is pretty trivial from that. Today, almost everybody trying to retrain models intraday. You know, there is, a, you know, you know we get into the, to the accuracy and characteristics of the models where you would love to retrain based on each transaction, on you know, each, you know, bid and ask in the financial systems and whatnot, on each new sticker on a, on a new, you know, uh, stream. So retraining becoming a problem. And, you know, for a classical ML, training is pretty trivial. It can be done almost in real time. For the deep learning, for the neural networks, retraining actually is fairly, um, fairly in a time-consuming operation, and um, I think the next frontier, one of the next frontiers in the machine learning, will be to really address the real-time retraining of the complex models, like you know your neural networks, for example. And quite naturally, you know, uh, you can't do it off the Hadoop. You cannot do it of any of the you know typical analytical systems. It will never be real-time, never. You're always going to be wasting hours and hours and moving data left and right. So in memory computing or in memory storage is, is about the only way to go. It could be different products, it could be different approaches, but doing it in memory is, is only physically possible way. You cannot really escape the laws of physics. You have to do it in memory on a, in, on a large data set in memory. So I think that's, you know, when it comes to, you know, to the machine learning in general, the, the real-time retraining, I mean, real-time is probably is a bit of a hope, but, you know, at least, you know, very fast retraining, something you can do in a matter of seconds versus hours, uh, is really exciting opportunity for ML. Okay, so we've heard uh, quite a bit about uh, the cloud over the last uh, day and a half. Um, you know, companies are increasingly moving to the cloud. Um, how is that trend going to impact in memory computing technology over the next two or three years and in the long term? Glad you asked that question. <laughs> talking about one aspect of that uh, immediately after this, uh, this session here. I think there's tons and tons of scope for in-memory computing in the cloud. 
in, in all sorts of dimensions from edge computing, caches both in the cloud, on premise, uh, database of record in the cloud. I, I think the world's our oyster, frankly, here. And it's, it's hard even to begin to think of all the possible ways that it can benefit in, people in the cloud. Um, so I think there's going to be a big explosion of stuff there, right? I mean, we're looking at launching a uh, times 10 cloud service very soon. Uh, Oracle already has a bunch of other cloud services, including Oracle database and memory. I mean, there's just lots and lots of stuff that can be done in the cloud. And I think uh, one of the interesting things for me is trying to use um, in-memory computing to sort of offset some of the problems with cloud performance, particularly hiding network latency by deploying fast caches close to the application when you're going sort of across cloud domains or even from on-premise to cloud. And as I say, I have a talk on that very shortly. So. I would agree with that. Uh, I think there's three comments I could make. First of all, it's uh, cloud is a very natural platform uh, for uh, IMC vendors like us to host services and offer them to customers. Second, it allows seamless integration with other existing cloud services like uh, the Azure IoT Hub or or other uh, hubs like on AWS. So, uh, and the third thing is that it allows us to think about designing scalability from the beginning. So we, instead of worrying about how many servers are available, we now can design for elasticity and scaling um, in everything we do and offer in the cloud. Uh, one thing I am trying to wrap my head around is how persistent memory in the cloud works. We tend to think of cloud instances as ephemeral, that the uh, cloud vendor can take them away and re-host us at any moment. We have to be prepared for that. So with persistent memory, you have to have persistent access to an instance, and maybe Nikita has the answer to that. <laughs> sure I do. <laughs> um, just like I mentioned in my keynote yesterday, uh, I do believe that the whole cloud story right now is a sore point. You know, if you go to any cloud provider, you can find you know, a gazillion of key value stores on disk, you know, just little, the whole zoo. Uh, you can barely find anything in memory. You know, there's a memcached in, that's about it, and that's pretty trivial. So there's not a single serious solution on the cloud available today. And um, I tend to have a much more uh, grounded view on this. And I think it do, pr 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 practically the reason for that is that, um, well, in memory data grids, and we can talk about a memory database, but in memory data grids specifically, it's a combination of a storage and a computational logic. And that's, you know, it's very hard to kind of you know, automate cloud enablement of the computational because it's your code. For example, when you write into Ignite a great game, you actually, your code that you write in any JVM language will be distributed across the cluster automatically. That's an enormous complexity to cloud enable it in any kind of automated fashion. And we, at great game, we've looked at it for years and years and that's a very, a complex problem to solve. We obviously had our images and we worked on Amazon for the last seven, eight years. That's not the issue. The issue is something that, to make it, you know, a literally cloud native, where you come into the, let's say, Azure or AWS, you click a button, a few check boxes, and then click go. And all of a sudden you have this totally automated system, like you would have today with many key value stores or traditional, you know, kind of, you know, plain manual SQL engines. And the reason is not that none of us think about it, is because you know, in many ways, in-memory computing is a, is, a, is a complex mix of in-memory storage and a complex distributed parallel programming. And um, that's, a, that's a conundrum that I don't really have a good answer yet for. I mean, uh, everybody's working on this pieces, and, but uh, that's, in my opinion, it's a very technical answer why we still don't have it in a, in a kind of widespread fashion, just like we have, you know, you know, literally dozens of key value stores and, you know, basic SQL engines on the clouds already. Okay, so um, yesterday we heard uh, about uh, Hope from, uh, from Matt Aslett, uh, or uh, also known as HTAP, Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, users implementing those solutions more and more. How do you see that? impacting in-memory computing over the next two or three years, or how do you see in-memory computing evolving to uh, support that as it becomes even more widespread? Someone else want to start on this one? Yeah. Well, I made a comment earlier. I just think it's a natural evolution of in-memory computing. It's what it was always intended for, and it's amazing it's, that it's taken this long, that's my opinion. Um, <laughs> so, because uh, we've been 
uh, using in-memory data grids to hold operational data uh, in order for fast access and fast updating for years, decade or more now, 15 years, I think. Um, and then, but we've been separately doing, as a community, uh, data parallel analytics um, on other systems. And it always uh, made no sense to me why we wouldn't do both in the same system. And so this is a very natural evolution, and I think it will allow in-memory uh, computing platforms to be used for mission-critical applications from soup to nuts um, without uh, having to have multiple systems, a data warehouse, along with an operational system. It's a, it's a comical topic for me. Uh, well, obviously, we heard about HTOP and, you know, great presentation from Matt Asla. I actually had an opportunity to, over the last, I would say, three, maybe four years, to actually ask, you know, probably three or four of our clients at Gridgate Systems, point blank this question. You know, we, you know, I often travel into the customers and just literally ask them, what, what are you guys doing? I, I point blank ask, why do you have separate analytics and separate OTP systems? I could never get an answer, literally. And I, I usually talk to, you know, fairly technical people. The answer goes like, well, we've always had it. What are you, what are you talking about? I mean, there is a teradata, and then there is SQL. There is a Hadoop, and the Mel, and the Spark, and whatever, and then there is data grids that you guys do. Why you even come? So n nobody can actually answer this question anymore. It's how bifurcated for literally, and for the lifetime of ours, that's been always. And if you think about a little bit deeper down, why, why the hell do we have this? Because we have all this complex ETL processes, moving data left and right, left and right, we have this, enormous complexity out of nothing just to do a basic, you know, literally basic statistical programming, which is the, you know, a normal word for what we call today analytics and machine learning. Uh, and if you think about a little bit deeper step away from this problem and kind of see trees behind a forest, it's fundamentally about performance. And it's precisely right. In memory computing is an implement technology that can help you to eliminate this root cause of this whole bifurcation. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen in the next three, five, even 10 years. But it's, it's absolutely the process is gonna go. Some of the pioneering organizations already doing this. In the next five years, we're gonna see more and more of these companies doing this because what's it for the company? It's billions of dollars of savings for you know, you're taking an average you know, financial service company in London and New York, that's a massive savings. Probably one of the biggest savings they could, it's much bigger than cloud in terms of the savings that the company can realize. And then we have technology like in memory computing. You know, and the next, in today, in the next whatever, you know, decade, they will have the technology and they will move to it. So for me, this is the biggest by far a business driver for adoption of memory computing going forward. Nothing else compares to it because nothing else has the equally big dollar sign attached to it than a move to the hybrid transactional analytical processing, which is actually a, you know, a fancy terminology which it should be basically called the normal data processing. You have that in one place, you can do transactional processing on it, you can analyze it, you can run statistics on it, Sounds logical, right? That's exactly how you would do it if you do it from scratch. <laughs> you wouldn't separate it any other way, but we do it. And um, I think that's gonna change. I agree. <laughs> okay, and then uh, our final question here. So um, stream processing is becoming uh, you know, more common, obviously. Um, how can in-memory computing uh, solutions add value to stream processing, especially with the explosion in applications for IoT? I think it's really just down to the speed again, and again, having stream processing capabilities integrated into the data platform, not outside it, having to call in to access the data, in my view, I think. It's, okay. it's all about speed. This is interesting. Uh, for the last five years or a little more, we've slowly seen um, a pattern emerge of customers doing stream processing and probably not even recognizing it. Um, like, for example, working with a cable television provider and, uh, that wanted to take streaming cha uh, channel change events from their customers to make 
uh, recommendations and to find service issues. And then moving on to, we spent a couple of years developing an e-commerce recommendation engine. And that's really a stream pr uh, processing application. And then IoT, as I mentioned earlier, is a now quickly emerging as a driver for in-memory computing. So in all of these, there's a, a pattern in which in, an in-memory computing platform becomes a natural host for the data you need to maintain, the state of the data sources, so that you can track what they're doing and make intelligent decisions about alerting or informing the devices to, make a, to, to command them to make a change. So in all of these cases, stream processing is core. I think, um, I don't want to argue with Nikita, but uh, because he's usually right, but uh, HTAP is a big driver, but I think stream processing is another big driver of in-memory computing, and I think we'll see a lot more use of, of our platforms in stream processing over the next few years. We'll see what Nikita says. <laughs> I would actually agree with Bill. Uh, what's kind of important stand for, there is, Streaming is not a storage. Streaming is, look at Kafka, probably the prime example of a good streaming technology, which is essentially an elastic buffer. Uh, and um, there is quite a few other projects, you know, in the products in this area. But, you know, streaming in them itself doesn't solve a single problem. You know, it's basically a mechanism to ingest the data and do some pre-processing or whatnot. You still need to store somewhere. Think about this. You're not streaming something to discard it. You're streaming, you're pre-processing, you're buffering it, so you can basically have, you know, different, different velocities of data coming in, in, a different, in the system. But in the end of it, you have to process it some way. You have to store it, at least portion of that. And that's, I think, Bill's absolutely right. The in-memory computing is, is, is part of the system, you know, and I'm sure for all of us here, you know, most of our customers have a stack that basically consists of our products and then Kafka in front of it and then something else as well. Because that's basically, you know, I don't like it with Bill, you know, most of the use cases today, that is coming in, in through streaming. That's, that's very natural. And um, it's actually very natural to model the data processing of the streams, just because we, now we have, you know, wonderful tools like Kafka that can actually help us to kind of mitigate the problem with velocity of data, with the difference in the velocities of, you know, of data, which we ingest in process. So yeah, and streaming is definitely, uh, a paradigm to stay, and um, but again, I don't think it's it's competitive or in any way with memory computing. It's literally very much synergetical, if you will. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, thank our panel members today. Thank you.